Stu Gatz here. The Dan Levitard Show podcast is brought to you by Capital One. Capital One wants to build a better bank, one that feels and acts nothing like a typical bank. It's why they're reimagining banking by offering accounts with no fees or minimums and one of the best saving rates in America. You can open a Capital One account from anywhere in five minutes. That's banking reimagined. Capital One, what's in your wallet? Capital One, and a. It's time. If the U is back. Turn over check. Turn over check. Yes. Turn over check. Leave the people. Chai. Turn over check. Turn over check. Turn over check. You ready, Dan? Yeah. T minus three days, baby. Woo, woo. Yeah. You. Put up your U, Dan. Yeah. Put it up. Dan, put up the U. The U's up. The U's up. Yeah. yeah. So people is least. And let's say ready. <laughs> and let's say ready. <laughs> Anyone seen Eddie's tires yet? Good luck finding them. Eddie is a good way to... That's exactly what a people in Miami would do, would call Ed Orgeron Eddie dismissively, condescendingly. Bro, that guy, Eduardo, but he goes by Eddie. Choke. <laughs> Arrepentido, bro. <laughs> we need to call him Eduardo Orgeron. Eduardo Orgeron. Ese tipo está arrepentido. <laughs> he's going by Ed to fill in to fit in in the bayou because he's uh, he's arrepentido. Bro, get ready for ba- the bayou that we're bringing over there. And bayou viene para the baby. <laughs> if he was the head coach down here, though, Eduardo. Yeah, like you do like Laranjega did, where he put the Enya in there. They think they're taking the bayou. We're bringing it bayou, bro. Aquí viene para That's good. I got it. I heard you the first time. If you want to keep that as a as a running theme throughout until we get to UMLSU, <laughs> you just saying in your accent, we're going to bring it by you, by you, any <laughs> any form of that. I'm with Eduardo. How do we smoke out Orgeron? Uh, I want to get him on the air, distract him, get him in trouble. Bro, I got a guy. I got a guy that can smoke him out, if you know what I mean. Ellis. Uh, declined our uh, interview request this week. They said they couldn't make it work. LSU? LS. It's not LSU. What's the matter with you, Stugat? The U. Where have you been? Where have you been, bro? It's not LSU. It's LS. They don't deserve that U. We've been over this 20 times, My apologies. Jeez. This is the one time that he doesn't want to shorten something into a nickname. It's the time that you make it LS. He's like, no, I'm here for you. Let me add the U. I was going to find him. Mike, what can you tell us about LSU? I know you're fired up for this. Should we go old school here? When is the right time to go old school? You remember, does this even hold up? If we were to go old school, Stugatz, and go to Michael Irvin's speeches, if you remember, one of the most seminal moments in the history of this show would have been the Michael Irvin speech. In fact, Mike and I were talking about something yesterday. We should, uh, You should have the audience uh, write in with what they believe to be seminal moments of the show for a project that Mike's working on. Um, Because one of them would be this Michael Irvin speech. For some reason, it really resonated. This is still played in the parking lot of UM games. People are playing it all over the place. But you're asking me if this holds up? Is that is that what you were? Because I think this holds up forever. I don't know if it does or not. We will find out together if it does. But for those of you who do not know, Michael Irvin came on here and he recreated the speech he made before a Miami FSU game. Michael Irvin is... As cartoonishly wonderful as any University of Miami player ever, there is no player more associated with the university in all of the ways. The, 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 the swagger, the getting in trouble, the being great, um, the be, being willful and being brash, loud, brash. And so Michael Irvin made the speech before an FSU game where he went into the locker room and then he came here and he made it. Now, Ray Lewis loved Phil Collins is in the air tonight. Who doesn't? For motivational purposes. At the time, though, we found that to be strange and then realized a ton of players listened to that song before to get themselves fired up. Uh, put it on the poll, Guillermo. Are you surprised that Phil Collins is in the air tonight is something that inspires athletes? But Ray Lewis loved this song, and so we put the music behind it. Mike, does this hold up? Does the Michael Irvin speech hold up? How old is it? It's 12 years old? This was um, in reference to, remember that Labor Day night game that Ja'Cory Harris won against FSU in Tallahassee? It kicked off the season. It still holds up, and actually it's pretty appropriate because that was a Labor Day weekend game, and this one against the LSU Tigers is a Labor Day weekend game, so let's get it. What time are you heading out? Right now. 
Right now. <laughs> wow, bro. You're crazy. I'm leaving tomorrow after work. I have to work tomorrow. <laughs> but we're driving straight. Where do you work? Where do you work? <laughs> so I, I have a couple I have a couple I have a couple of things going on. Don't worry about that. I mean nine to five al sun, but after that, you know, sometimes, you know, if you want to get in like a watch, I got you. You wanna to go to twelve, I got you. We got a couple places here and there. You know. Don't worry about me where I work. <laughs> they are. But I'm telling you, people is a drug dealer, right? People whoa, is whoa, 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 no, no, whoa, no, no, whoa, 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 <laughs> it's just, you got a ride or no? You, you need, you need, who's going? Who's, who's who's coming with us? We got like uh, us. Whoa, there's more than one of you. We got a. What, you need gas money. There's gonna be a couple of us, maybe eight or nine. <laughs> My buddy Frank, he's gonna be there. <laughs> Frankie, Frankie, a couple people. Are you coming with us or not? We need to know. I need to. I need. To, I'm getting head count right now. <laughs> now I, I at the. What I know about people's work, though, is that he doesn't actually go. He just says he's going to go, and he doesn't actually go. Bro, you say I'm go. a liar? What are you talking about here? <laughs> it's like a four-hour drive. We'll be there in no time. Boom, it's boom. It's not, not a four-hour drive. It's not How like, long is I, it? I made that drive. It's like 15 hours, 11 hours. 11 hours? <laughs> no, exactly. Not the way I drive, bro. <laughs> 11 hours. You're driving to Canada? What are you talking about 11, 11 hours? There no time. Mike, does the does the Michael Irvin speech hold up? Put it on the poll, Guillermo. Does the Michael Irvin speech hold up? Because it's got a lot of cliches in it. Of course it holds up. And just so appropriate on, on a Labor Day weekend. He actually did one last year uh, before the game that announced with authority that the U was back against Notre Dame. We should probably tell people that after that one speech, I believe the Hurricanes went out and lost like 9-3 to three or something. Like it wasn't, they, they, they went out to FSU, they didn't do anything. Didn't they lose like 9-7 or something in a truly epically bad game despite all of Michael Irvin's motivation? Well, this was right around the time. I, I was listening to the Canes Insight podcast and I sort of mentioned this point uh, last week. Which the last time these two teams met was in the Chick-fil-A Bowl. Uh, on a on a New Year's game, it was towards the end of that Miami early two thousands run, and they beat us up in the tunnel, and then they beat us up on the field. They were swinging helmets, knocking our players out, and you could sort of draw a line right. as that was the day mm -hmm. that the U had died, pretty much, where the SEC took all that swag. We got so beat up. So this is a nice little revenge yeah. game. Yep. We announced in Notre Dame last year. We're back. Yep. Now, if you're writing a wrestling promo, you seek revenge on the team that ended your run, that ended that era. And you do it in Dallas on a national TV uh, game the night before Labor Day. It's going to be, people, it's going to be so wild. Oh, my bad. I thought the game was at LSU. I didn't, Dallas is a, dr a longer drive than that. Have you not been paying attention? We've been talking about Dallas for like two weeks now. I know, and Eduardo also, when Eduardo was pumping up the game Eddie. for the masses, <laughs> Eddie Orgeron. Yeah, that guy, bro, please. <laughs> that guy, bro. He doesn't even know what's coming. He doesn't, I feel bad. They go, pena, bro, what's happening to him? He doesn't, he's not going to have a job next week. I feel bad. I know people, they can hook him up, but that guy, bro, <laughs> desempleo. AT&T Stadium, Dallas, Texas. I know our fans are going to be excited. Take over that stadium and turn it into Death Valley. Oh, talk trash with him, Eduardo. Bro, that guy, we tried to have him on so we could have a civil conversation, and he, he ducked. Yeah. He's afraid of us. He's afraid of me, but he's afraid of us. He's afraid of the you. He knows what's coming. Death Valley. What the hell is Death Valley? What is Is that their stadium name? That that used to Cute. well, Clemson. <laughs> Clemson, Cute. yes, Clemson. And they both go by Death Valley, don't they? LSU and Clemson. Yeah, both it's a little confusing. They both have a valley of death. <laughs> they both have a valley of death. <laughs> Clemson's is a little deadly. In fact, Guillermo put that on the poll. Should there be two valleys of death? There should only be one, right? There was one, the OB. And then the Marlins came and ruined that for everybody. <laughs> Why isn't Billy Corbin like the, the mayor yet? <laughs> Honestly? Or like the governor? When's that going to happen? 
or Luke, exactly, Luke. When's that going to happen? How do we make that happen? Is it too late? When's the next election? Well, you actually have to go out and vote, people. Well, I can't vote. <laughs> People's not a voter. They don't allow felons to vote. Guillermo, put it on the poll. Is people a voter? Because people says he's going to drive to Dallas after work on Friday, and then he just gets into the beers, right? He never he never actually leaves Miami. Oh, people, you got to be careful. In Dallas, they got blue laws. You can't buy beer or wine before noon on Sunday, and you can't buy bottles of alcohol at all on Sunday. What do you mean buy? I'm taking it with me. <laughs> You think you're buying things at the game? You know how expensive You win the lotto, bro? You're <laughs> buying beer? You just take it with you. I have a guy that does stuff. He, you know, he, he makes his own drinks. Not beer per se. But it's like a little brewery he has. Do you want to talk trash to Ed Orgeron? Like, or Eduardo, do you want to go down the Bayou path? Like, I, can we close this segment? Instead of having Michael Irvin motivate us for UM against LSU, can we get a, some sort of motivational speech from people, the character you've created? We're doing this now or we're going to save it till tomorrow? Because here's the thing, Dan, there's like three days. You know, motivation wears off sometimes. But I want it to build up. I, it can be even stronger tomorrow. You said people's listo. You said he's ready. I am ready, but I, I can't, you know, I have to save some of my some of my energy for tomorrow. I can't do all my energy now, Dan. Then I won't have energy for the game. The last thing I want to do is lose my voice, bro. We just make so much noise in Dallas. The last thing I want to do is get super hype, super lit right now, and then on Friday, Saturday, whatever. When's the game? Sunday. Sun- Sunday? Yeah. yeah. Do we work on Monday? Labor Day. No. No. There's oh. no work Monday? No, it's Labor Day. All right, then I'm there for sure. I was worried because, you know. What happened to your pregame speech? You're not going to do it? You want to wait until, what, Saturday when we're not on the air to do your pregame speech? What is my pregame speech? <laughs> I don't write things, Dan. It just comes to my head. You speak from the heart right here. Right there. That's where it comes from. You think Michael Irvin wrote that down? <laughs> you think Ray Lewis is writing these things down? You speak from the heart. That's how the great speech givers speech give. <laughs> you know anything about this? You know anything about this, you? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I went there. You're that guy. I just Whoa. realized who you are. Bro. Pell oh, Pelgrant. Pelgrant Pell guy over here. The guy that ruined the U. Jack is rim. What are you doing Jack here? Jack is rim. Where's your car? What kind of car you drive? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> Just asking. What kind of car you drive? It's a Mercedes. <laughs> oh, really? What color is it? What year? Black matte convertible. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you drive a souped up Civic? <laughs> Civic? No, bro. Accord. What up? Message and data rates may apply. When did it become okay for men to be lazier, softer, fatter? We need to bring the men of this country back to greatness. And it's easier than ever with Ageless Male Max, a patent-pending formula with an ingredient that helps boost your total testosterone, promoting greater increases in muscle size and twice the reduction of body fat percentage than exercise alone. Plus, an amazing 64% increase in nitric oxide, which can be handy in the gym and in the bedroom. Take your manhood to the max by trying your first 30-day bottle free. Just pay shipping and handling. Not 10 days, not 15 days, but a full 30-day supply free. When you text the word JOLT to 797979. Finally, a formula that boosts total testosterone. If your results with Ageless Male Max are too intense, please decrease use. For your free bottle, text JOLT. To 797979. Text J O L T to 797979. Don Lebatard. Touchdown Miami's Aquarium Lolita. <laughs> Come see Flipper. <laughs> Come see Lolita swim in a bathtub. <laughs> Stugats. Come see sharks, possibly drugs, swimming in green water. <laughs> Spend five dollars on a wax figure that you'll regret as soon as you get home. This is the Dan Lebatar show with the Stugats on the ticket. Quick shout out to the MacArthur Causeway. It's making my life a living hell, but it's allowing me to listen to every podcast ever about this huge game. I've listened to Bayou Bengals reports. I've listened to ESPN radio affiliates out of Louisiana. I listened to an amazing Five Rings podcast with the legend Joe Z. Zagaki. He was incredible. D Money with the Canes Inside podcast got me fired up. I know almost everything about this game now. 
And let me tell you something, brother. It's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. I'm not nearly as cocky as I was a couple of weeks ago. Um, maybe I've just got too much information on my mind right now. But this Devin White and this Greedy Williams and this NFL defense that uh, the Hurricanes are playing on Sunday night are really, really scary. So those are LSU players. Those are LSU players, and I feel like you uh, y- y- you sound like an expert when you just say college players' oh, yeah. names. You do. It sounds it's really a, impressive. Like for instance, you're super excited about the uh, FAU. You're you're an L, right? Who? You're, you're an L and a Kane. <laughs> Um, like a lot of people are like, uh, Canes and, and, and Panthers down here. Uh, you say FAU and Motor Singletary, who's ramp- ramping up a Heisman campaign. Yeah. They're going up against Kyler Murray and the Oklahoma Sooners. You sound like the most informed expert when it comes to college football. What do you know about that game? Yeah, hashtag Motor for Heisman. There's a billboard on I 95 for. Devin Singletary, he's a legit Heisman candidate. I don't know if legit's a real word. No, he's super legit. He's super legit. Yeah, this is an exciting right. game between FAU and Oklahoma. There's yeah. a lot of upset alert chatter. FAU's super exciting. I was feeling like upset alert could be a possibility until I saw the spread was 21. That's actually a lot of respect for a program like FAU. A lot of respect. For a week one game... That's a, a ton of respect, but back to the Hurricanes for a second, because this game is an absolute monster. There's a lot of NFL talent on the field, and essentially, like a broken record, it's going to come down to Malik Rozier. Yeah. And I understand why you don't think Malik Rozier is capable of doing the things necessary to win this game, because what you're going to have to do to win this game is make plays downfield. Greedy Williams is exactly that. He's a man defender who likes to take chances. How do you shake man coverage? You shake him with deep comeback routes, and that's precisely what Amon Richards is good at. And Malik Rozier is really good at that, too. I love the fact that Jeff Thomas is now working in the slot because Braxton Berrios has gone on to the NFL. Jeff Thomas... A lot of speed. One of the fastest players uh, we've seen at the University of Miami. But he was really one-dimensional last year as a true freshman. He was just nine-routing you. And there's going to be a place for that against LSU. But you get a fast player like Jeff Thomas now coming out of the slot. There's a lot of creative things that you can do with him, whether it's a screen, a jet sweep uh, with Jeff Thomas. There's more ability to get that kind of speed uh, in space. Now, Devin White for LSU... That guy's got 4-4 speed at linebacker, so he's going to blow up a lot of plays. And I don't necessarily know if you can run up the middle. By the way, Mike Rick, uh, Mark Rick, sorry, Mike Rick, Mark Rick, he's gotten fullbacks on this roster now. And it seems as though there might be a return to the old Mark Rick identity, which was a very pro style offense, which was run heavy in traditional formations. You have Rayleigh George maybe going up the middle. I don't think that's the exact, this is the exact team that you want to do that against. Maybe save that for at Toledo. You're going to have to try to out athlete some incredible athletes at LSU. But I'm excited. I think University of Miami wins this game. I think it's going to be really close, Chris. The the more I read about it as well, I get more nervous too. LSU apparently has played in these neutral site games at Jerry's World like three or four times, and they've never lost. Mark Richt four and four career against LSU. Um, I don't know. Mark Richt seems pretty confident that the crowd will be split. What do you think? Like, do you think it'll be mostly LSU? There's it is going to be mostly LSU, but there's this false narrative out there that the University of Miami fans don't travel well. They absolutely do travel well, especially around the ACC. Dallas, it's not easy. As I, as someone that's going out there, I know exactly how difficult it is for people from Miami to get to this game this weekend. But I think there's going to be a really strong turnout. There's a lot of buzz around this program. And the team is good. The team is good. There's a lot of unknowns about LSU, which presents a challenge. We don't know what offense LSU is going to be running because their offensive coordinator doesn't. There's no real film on this offense coordinator. It's a brand new offensive coordinator. You're left to assume that they're just going to do typical LSU things. which Run is the ball. Run the ball. Uh, be fairly conservative, but take the occasional chance downfield. Uh, be, be pretty boring. However, Joe Burrow, he's a quarterback that was recruited by Urban Meyer and was on the roster at Ohio State for a very long time. Two-time Gatorade High School Player of the Year in Ohio. You know a thing about Urban Meyer quarterbacks. They're not exactly just stand back in the pocket and throw. They're guys that can run. You think about Tebow. You think about JT Barrett. You think about Braxton Miller. You think about Alex Smith. These are guys that can do the the read option. That's not something that we've seen with our LSU football. It's really punch them in the mouth. But how are they going to punch us in the mouth? They don't have Leonard Fournette. 
They don't have guys. There's question marks in that backfield. They have another Fournette that's not nearly as good. They have wide receivers that we think are okay just because LSU recruits well. The quarterback's going to have to make some plays, and he's a total unknown. But also, from a national perspective, there's good Malik Rozier and bad Malik Rozier. And if you're going recency bias, you just know bad Malik Rozier because that's who he was towards the end of the season. 40 of 89 to close the season. Five interceptions. The majority of his sacks. He was a different player. There were some injuries. He lost Herndon. He lost Richards. I understand all that. Daryl Langham going downfield isn't the same exact thing as Amon Richards going downfield. But it's a little scary because you're supposed to get better as the season progresses. And he wasn't. He was getting worse. Was that because there was more tape on, on Malik Rozier? Or is that just because he couldn't make adjustments? We'll see. He's been incredible in camp. But that's what you have to go off of. People telling you that he's great. That's a lot... That's a lot of trust to put into just reading Barry Jackson, who does an incredible job covering this team, because your eyes told you he couldn't hang with Pitt. How is he going to hang with LSU? I mean, what other options do they have, though? They can't start this freshman quarterback, right? you got to go with No, Will- Williams is not. He's not even in the conversation. I meant the red shirt, like Perry and oh, the and, guy. Oh, well, Perry can't even beat out Weldon. You don't know who your backup quarterback is. Not that that's an issue because Malik Rozier is the guy, without question. He's the guy. But Perry, if Perry, we were talking about Perry as if he could beat out Malik Rozier towards the end of the last season. He can't even definitively beat out Weldon. That would seem to be an issue. But you don't have to just lean on Malik Rozier, even though I'm telling you he's going to have to step up and make the plays. What you do know about Malik Rozier is he does occasionally rise uh, when the moment calls for it. He's got guts. I like that in college. I overvalue it. I also like quarterbacks that can hit open receivers downfield. So we'll see exactly what happens on, on Sunday night. But if he does step up on Sunday night, and if he makes the right reads, and if we start hitting these comeback routes, and we start beating LSU downfield with a tremendous secondary, first-rounders all over that defense, potentially. Malik Rozier is a guy who could... I'm going to sound ultra-ridiculous, even more ridiculous than I have. Malik Rozier is a guy that if he can do it against LSU, he could potentially, this is crazy, Heisman? he could potentially uh, post a very sneaky Heisman campaign this season. You blew my mind. <laughs> Take it back up. Take it back up. Hold on. So, Any yeah, Please. Yeah. Well, so much of this offense is dependent on him. That's why he's a total yardage hoarder, right? If he's actually really good at his job, he's going to be in that Heisman conversation. The University of Miami is favored in every game this season. You, t- you mean to tell me an undefeated team with a quarterback that's actually stepping up and making the plays, that quarterback's going to be in the Heisman conversation regardless, which is a little crazy. You're it, not making your quarterback a Heisman <laughs> contender. You didn't just do that. You've insane. crossed the line, this Mike, is, with this, your homerism. You didn't is, just make this guy that you were crushing all of last season a legitimate Heisman contender. I'm proud of you. Not all of last season. Not all of last season. Plenty of times last season. And I'm saying he could potentially be a dark horse Heisman candidate. <laughs> if he does his job. If he does his job. You have to attack this LSU team. What about Travis Homer? Travis Homer, that dude. Is Another a- Heisman, potentially? Huh? Potentially. Yeah. Potentially. There's a couple guys on this Miami offense <laughs> that can be national names, especially if they go out and perform on a national spotlight game such as Sunday night. Joe Jackson's another guy on the defensive line who could be, he's talked about already as a, as a first-round pass rusher, but, man, there, there could be double-digit sacks for Joe Jackson yeah. this season. There could be double-digit sacks. And for this game specifically against LSU, look, Miami has their own question marks on the offensive line, but there are question marks on the LSU offensive line as well, especially the right side. And that's where Joe Jackson lives. You pin that dude's ears back. You let him go. Burrow is apparently the type of guy that has enough athleticism, even though it might surprise you just based off looks, because he looks like a Mettenberger uh, dude by the gif that they put out there. But he's athletic enough to get away from some pressure. That's the book on him. But Joe Jackson and Garvin on the other side and the rotation of the freshman Rousseau in there. On the, on the edges, the University of Miami is going to be as fearsome as almost anybody else outside of Clemson. And Clemson, I don't know what sort of voodoo you're doing to keep these kids in school. 
Seriously. We are so many years far off from Clemson right now. Guillermo, put it on the poll. College football guy who uses phrases like on the edges. Douche or no douche? No douche. Computer, execute 12.4p operation. Optimizing algorithm. Running encryption packet alpha. Night, night. Oh, I don't feel so good. What? What is it, computer? Is it hot in here? It feels hot in here? I feel a little clammy. I should lie down or something. A computer with a virus? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. Those oysters Rockefeller were a mistake. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Don Lebatard. Would you mind if the new owners of the Marlins knocked down that statue in center field? It's obviously an eyesore, but it's gotten to the point that it's, you know, our yeah. eyesore. Really? Like, you guys yeah, have yeah. gotten it's, there. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that we all laugh at together. Yeah, it's right. so bad that it's become good. You wouldn't go to New York and take away the apple, Dan. Come on. Stugats. Would you guys look at a lot of other things and describe it that way? It's something that I mock, but it's something that is in the middle of my city. So, therefore, I'm proud of it and don't want it removed. Pitbull. Okay. Uh, you win. This is the Dan Levatar Show with the Stugats on the ticket. People, reports from the bayou. Les Miles still has his rims and chromies. Still has them. The hell does Les Miles have to do with this? He's not the coach, bro. I know, but we got to steal his too, don't we? No? Yeah. I don't understand now, it. Now you're taking it too far. Now you've turned this into a crime spree. You don't know how to play this game, man. What are you doing? I thought just any LSU person, anybody, Odell Beckham, Landry. uh, Jarvis Landry, Jamarcus Russell, you just want to take his rims too? I mean, poor guy. Rims and chromies, anyone from LSU, Fournette. Isn't he one of our coworkers, bro? (laughs) Yeah, let's take his rims and chromies. No, he's a friend of ours. I'd stay away from Fournette, man. I really would. I wouldn't go around anything that Fournette owns, man. He finds out it's you with big trouble, man. There's a thing called a line, Dan, and you're getting really close to it. Really close. David Sampson, Marlins, uh, former Marlins team president, joins us right now on the Orion Fuel and Downstairs convenience store guest line. They are truly steps beyond convenient. Are you still working for the Marlins? Are you still employed by them? I am not currently employed by the Marlins. Okay. Thank you for asking though. Okay, so are you but are you out of like how did it work with you? Forgive me for forgive my ignorance here, but you had <laughs> some sort of like you you were going to keep working for them or just keep getting paid by the Marlins for a period of time, right? You told us until I don't even know when it was supposed to be. Is it over yet? Uh Halloween. Okay, that's what I was asking you. So that the, the gloves come off Halloween? I didn't say the gloves come off. I said the whole bodysuit may come off. All right, right. everything. All right, full frontal nudity. David Sampson with us on ESPN (laughs) Radio. I'm going Jay Davidson. Um, People were asking me here during the break, and I forget what they were talking about. They said you were reviewing some old movie. What's the old movie you're reviewing today? So I did something I haven't done in a while. I took 82 minutes yesterday and watched a movie called Half-Baked, which I had never seen. Wow. Does it hold up? I, that, like, does oh, it? it it's, how do I know if it holds up? I'd never seen it before, and it was 82 minutes of hilarity. I can't believe I missed this movie. I was a total Cheech and Chong guy, and I've been wrong. Half-Baked is really smart. The only disappointing part is Chappelle doesn't like it. He thought his original script was way funnier. But to me, I laughed out loud so many times that I had to pause, and I kept count. It took me 91 minutes to watch the 82-minute movie. Mike, why don't you call Neil Brennan and have him talk to Samson? Didn't Neil Brennan write half of Half Baked? Like, just I, if if he's all excited, but you just want Mike to call Neil at nine forty in the morning, just assume he's around to have a conversation Neil, with David Samson. Neil likes to talk to our show. Do you? Would, didn't he? Well, first of all, let's find out. Did he co-write Half Baked? Did, did. Because it it because it is smart. It's a smart movie. It actually, here's the thing that was interesting. It's not just a dumb stoner movie. There's very subtle things that are going on in that movie that are very interesting. There's race relations. There's comments about when to use drugs, when not to use drugs, how to use drugs. The irony of the whole movie is that the title is just off because obviously no one in that movie or watching that movie is only half-baked. So what? tell us a little bit more, though, because this is, uh, we've been talking around here uh Billy hadn't seen Die Hard. Right. It's that's a that's a pretty big hole in the movie resume of David Sampson, is it not? That he had not seen Half Baked. 
It's a double feature of holes. I haven't seen half-baked or dazed and confused. So I, I did just half-baked, and I may go back-to-back back with dazed and confused today if my brain can handle it. And so how does this work with David Sampson and, and watching these old movies? How many more are you going to go looking for? I don't know, because I, I watched a current documentary called Tickled yesterday as well. Uh, and I want to review that in a later week. It's the most insane documentary I've ever seen in my life. It's literally about competitive endurance tickling, an entire documentary. Oh, wait, so I, I saw that. Back. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. But that's just, that, there was a sex scandal there, too, I think. Is that the documentary? Uh, there was yeah. there There was a tickling tournament that ended up being, it's weird. That movie's weird. You saw Tickled? Yes. We are two of ten people who have seen it. And it is There was a dude unreal. running a uh, spoiler alert, there's a dude running a slush fund to just create tickle tournaments all over the United States, and then he was a weirdo who was like a recluse who was in hiding while making men, you know, competitive men, you know, tickle each other. <laughs> do you guys have anything better to do? I mean honestly. <laughs> what do you mean? It's a it's a good movie. By the what? way, not only is it in the United States, guys, it's around the world, and these men are handcuffed and tied down to a bed while other men attach themselves to this person and tickle him for minutes at a time. It's insanity. <laughs> Don't you? I imagine you with all of your picadillos, like you've told us, you got a panic room and you've got some OCD stuff and you're afraid of the you're afraid of the dark. I imagine that the idea of people tickling you is mortifying to you. <laughs> like, I just imagine that you, with your hands tied and anyone tickling you, would be something that you consider the height of horror. It's, it is. It's one of the reasons why that is not in my uh, vernacular for any sort of S&M. I will not be handcuffed be for risk of tickling. It would make me insane. <laughs> I can't even believe there. I was thinking, watching the documentary, what amount of money would I take to allow myself to enter this tournament? And it, there is none. And I really don't think I would do it even for a million dollars. I have a prize. And, and David, how do you win again? Like, what's the point of the competition? No, the point of the competition is this old creepy guy gets to watch men tickle each other. That's exactly what it is. There is a convi there's a felon who, spoiler alert, a felon who videos everything, and I can only uh, there's no women involved. The movie I'll was super that. weird, and uh, the only thing that was unsatisfying about it to me was the conclusion because uh, because this guy was using wealth to simply f fund a tickling empire. <laughs> like, it was, he was just it buying was boy toys. He was, he was actually the son of a really rich lawyer in, on the East Coast, and he took his entire trust fund, and he put it toward tiring boys to do tickling for each other. It's totally crazy. He got caught on camera by the documentarian, and he was this, he, he looked like the Unabomber to me. You just can't even imagine how he would fund all these good-looking guys, all of whom were willing to either tickle or be tickled for a fee. David, uh, this Yelich thing isn't working out. Oh, my God. Yelich goes six for six yesterday, hits for the cycle. Like, that's the one that hurts the most, David. That's the one that hurts the most because you knew he was going to be great and you knew you guys had him cheap. You know, he did something that was interesting in the off season when the other trades were made. He said, I don't want to be here, and he asked for a trade. And I know JT Realamuto asked for a trade as well, and you tend not to grant trades to players who ask. On the other hand, I, you know, you've heard Derek Jeter say it publicly. We want players here who want to be here, and I get that. I really do. Uh, they got a big return for Jeter. Uh, for Jeter, that's funny. They got a big return for Yelich, and it just hasn't worked out yet. But it's too early to say that it's totally not going to work out. It just feels that way now. But that's the one that hurts the most, is it? Not the MVP whose contract you unloaded and you needed to unload the contract. You had Yelich is absolutely someone you build around. He's cheap enough, valuable enough, young enough, great enough that that has to be someone you keep, even if you're reducing payroll. The question is, do you feel that he will still be under contract when your team is ready to win? And you answer that question by trading him. So that's a tough question to ask and have answered for your fan base. It's you and Jeffrey who got the big returns from Jeter. That's the truth, man. <laughs> that's the truth. Those guys, uh, there, there were no, there have been no returns so far for the Marlins with Jeter. They got it from Sherman. Yeah, and oh, yeah, Sherman. Sure. That's yes. right, too. Yes. What do you make of the Marlins rule here? They're bringing in, they're allowing flags. 
They're allowing uh, noisemakers. They are pandering to the brown people on Calle Ocho that you guys have always <laughs> failed to get. You laugh. You laugh, but it's just such an overt. Right. That's exactly the right. No, no, that. but that's exactly what the response should be because it's such an overt grab. God. Like, we'll get the Latin people here with music and flags. No, you won't. Nobody ever has. Nobody will. I don't really appreciate the fact that on this show, if I said that I were pandering to brown people, I would be subject to unbelievable hatred. You get to say it, so I'm going to say it differently. They're trying to pander to anyone who will buy a ticket, <laughs> and I tried that too. Remember when we had Vuvuzela night, and we were mocked on this show? I did a segment with you guys back in the day, and you guys played the Vuvuzela soundtrack for literally one minute of the segment. Do you recall that? Uh, yes, I do recall that, because you guys were also pandering to brown people. <laughs> Listen, what do you expect? a small Jewish guy to do. Isn't that what we do? We're trying to build a fan base. We're trying to get people to come into this, to the ballpark. I, I like that the Marlins are trying anything. I just don't like that it's only in one section because that sort of makes it look like circus animals in a cage. Like, are you sure you want to be in that section? <laughs> doing <laughs> this was your move night this was your grand marketing idea yes. that's <laughs> that you I were... thought it was elephants on the serengeti unbelievable sounds like too many it can't be a marlin's good yeah it can't. so many move <laughs> that's the funniest soundtrack ever i don't know if it's real but it's awesome so it's, it's an interesting marketing promotion but you're seeing attendance down everywhere teams are trying all sorts of stuff David, what's the worst? Uh, did we just discuss it? What's the worst marketing idea that happened under your watch? Oh, that's a great question. What a great wow. question. How about bringing out a shaking Ali for the opening day? A, sh- a quivering Ali. <laughs> that wasn't marketing. That game was already sold out. <laughs> How about I would say I would say the worst marketing thing we did in building the ballpark was naming a section called the home run sections, the home run porch. And it was a place where no one could hit home runs to. <laughs> so I would God's say that, that was not our finest moment. It was that time that you sold tickets to uh, Roy Halladay's uh, perfect game, was it? Uh... That was awesome. That was after the fact. People actually, we sold a ton of those, like 20,000 tickets. Really? After the fact. That's $20,000 out of nowhere. Wouldn't you do that if you could? Yes. <laughs> Look at your talking. You're a genius. Uh, yes, unless you're trying totally not to cheapen yourself in every way. Not everyone can have the morals that you have, Levitard, but everyone sitting around you in that studio would have done the exact thing I did every day of the week. Yep. Is that true, Guillermo? Put it on the poll. Would you have sold the Roy Halladay perfect game tickets if they'd come against your team <laughs> as a way Wait, David, of grabbing a few extra dollars? David, like, can you can you translate that? You said 20,000 tickets. Translate that into dollars so the shipping container, because they're shaking their head no. I'm saying yes, it's a genius idea. How much money did that translate into? We sold them at face value. Tickets in the upper deck, let's say the average price was $10. So let's say $200,000 minus revenue sharing that you had to give back. I'm trying to be technical and real. So let's say a net of about $135,000. Wow. We'd all do it. Wow. For doing nothing. Wow. Right. Well, what, what, no, nothing. no, and for your team, literally doing nothing for your, <laughs> for, for, nothing. no, but your lineup, your lineup literally did nothing. I, I, I can, I hear what you're saying, but I, I vehemently disagree. It's a great question, though, right? Because Pete, that was publicly panned, right? But they just found one hundred twenty thousand dollars in the gutter. Do you know how hard that is to do in Miami without blood and cocaine on it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with Listen, that- I spend my afternoons looking for square groupers. Short of that, I'm going to find other ways. I mean, with that money, you could buy a hundred thousand West Helmses. <laughs> You, how many guys did you guys buy for a dollar? Wes Helms, was he the only one you guys bought in the dollar store? I think we got Cody Ross for a dollar. We got Dan Ugla for like 20 grand. Uh, we got Justin Bohr for 20 grand. There's some value out there, no doubt. <laughs> Wes Helms, dollar, dollar store. Uh, Still overpaid. Yeah, Samson, good talking to you. We'll talk to you next week.
Hey, take care, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, we got to get to some of the good stories. Just, like soon, we're going to get to the good stories, right? We've got to yeah. we've got to keep him on the air until uh, whatever it is that the, the, I don't even know what the hell he signed non disclosure, whatever it is that the, he can't talk like well, totally. He said, he said it's over after after Halloween. Halloween, right? yeah. Halloween, the boogeyman actually comes right. out. Right. I mean, there's there are going to be some great stories there, right? We are going to find out. I mean, he's already been willing to tell us some of the crud they did, like the the idea that they were inflating attendance numbers and just buying them for a dollar. Can we have him on? It's November 1st, so that's a Thursday. That's the day he normally joins us. Can we just have him on for an hour and just open up the microphone and just tell him to go? On November 1st? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> they sold uh, They sold Edison Volkes' no-hitter tickets after the game, too. Like, I have a picture of the screen that says tickets for this game are available for sale at the ticket window. I mean, one of the amazing things that watching them uh, do business in this market, the idea of an, a social experiment where a, a professional sports team gives zero bleeps about public relations, where it's just all business. It's commerce in a way that's uncomfortable. But it's just like, yep, Edison Volquez, you weren't at the game. We'll sell the tickets if we can get $10 from you. Roy Halladay, we'll sell the tickets if we can get 100000 We will scrape every gutter to make money because we are so not major league. And it worked. They cleared a billion dollars on right? it. Yep. I mean, they did it so coldly. It is a testament to not buying into the sports mythology and just treating it as commerce and capitalism. Jeter will re- uh, realize this soon, and he'll do what he has to do. He will. Man, I don't think... G- that, well, the, one of the reasons it's fascinating is because Jeter's always kind of cared about public relations. Like, right. Jeter's coming from a franchise that cares about public relations. Like, these guys made a killing down here not caring at all that they were stuffing a business. 